الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. We'll be covering the world of the angels and the jinn. As this is a topic which is often neglected when Islam is being presented, its system of beliefs are being presented, it tends to be glossed over. And as such, uh, people tend to rely on folklore, myths, and misunderstandings to, as their source of knowledge in this area. First, the world of the angels. And it is a part of Islamic faith, as we said, to believe in the angels. And what this means fundamentally is belief in their existence. And whatever Allah has revealed in the Quran, the scripture, and the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, has clarified to us about them with regards to their names, their attributes, and their roles. This is the basic belief that Muslims are obliged to accept. And for those who would question, because as we're going to look at the world of the angels and we see that they have such an intricate role within our own world, why did Allah need to have angels do the things that they have been assigned to do. We may as well ask, why did Allah have the force of gravity governing certain bodies in this life or other forces or, or, or laws of thermodynamics or bi, you know, biochemical uh, principles? Why did Allah have these things? Because surely, Allah could have others. There could be other principles or other laws governing different aspects of nature. Similarly, if Allah had wished, He could have had other creatures or other principles governing the things that we now know as those governed by angels. However, Allah chose to have the force of gravity and He chose to have angels. And that's the bottom line. He knows what is best and what he has created is the best that could be created. He informed us about the world of the angels. Though we would not be able to discover this world through our own scientific means, etc., he informed us about this world for a particular reason. And when we look at the, the relationship between the world of the angels and the human world, we can see what is the wisdom behind us knowing about the world of the angels. First and foremost, we should understand that the angels are created from light. This is not stated in the Quran, this is stated in the Sunnah in Sahih Muslim, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr and the third wife of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said the angels were created from light. The jinn from fire and Adam from what has already been described to us. So the angels and the jinn represent two separate beings from the spiritual world. From the Islamic perspective, there are three different species of intelligent beings. The mankind, the angels and the jinn. All of these having essentially a spiritual base. That is human beings, though they may be uh, visible and they function in the visible world, their souls inhabit the world of invisible, invisible and rational beings. Now, the angels Though invisible to us, normally, 
We did mention in the previous session with regards to Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, and the prophets, that the revelation which was brought by Angel Gabriel sometime was brought when Angel Gabriel was in the form of a man. On occasion, that man was visible to the companions themselves. And on other occasions, he wasn't. However, there are amongst Allah's creatures those who are able to see the angels even when they are invisible. Abu Huraira reported in a narration collected by Abu Dawood and also found in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim that if you hear a rooster crow, ask Allah for his grace, for it has seen an angel. Now, the general form of the angels is not as is portrayed in the Greco-Roman legends where the angels, like Cupid, you know, is a little baby with wings on his back flying around with a bow and arrow, or, you know, as a man walking around with a pair of wings on his back, you know, a pair of uh, bird-like wings on his back. When the angel appeared in the form of a man, he was a man, not with any wings. But Allah has described the angels as having wings, but the wings we should not think of in terms of human terms or in terms of the, the uh, wings of birds, etc. Because Allah has described uh, in the Quran, in chapter Fatir, verse 1, Alhamdulillah, Fatir is Samawati wal Ard, Ja'il al Malaikati Rusula, Uli Ajnihatin Mathna wa Thulatha wa Ruba'a. يَزِيدُ فِي الْخَلْقِ مَا يَشَاءُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ All praise is due to Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who made the angels messengers with wings two, three, and four, and he increases in the creation as he wills. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, companion of the Prophet wasallam, reported that Allah's messenger had seen Angel Gabriel in his natural state, in which he had 600 wings, each of which filled the horizon. And they were like multicolored drops of pearls and coral falling from the wings. So the angels in their natural state are quite huge. So much so that in another narration uh, related by Jabir ibn Abdullah, uh, with regards to the angels that carry the throne of Allah. Prophet Muhammad said, Allow me to speak about one of the thro throne bearers. The distance between his earlobe and shoulder is what a bird would fly in 700 years. So we're talking about a huge aspect of Allah's creation. Now, the angels, though they appeared, when they appeared in, in, in a human form, they appeared as males, because uh, it, one of uh, the appearances, the companions described that he looked like one of the companions whose name was Dihya al-Kalbi, that he looked similar to him, and at other times he appeared like a, an unknown Bedouin, Though he's been described, they have been described as in male forms, they're not considered to be either male or female. Nor is there any evidence in Islamic texts to indicate that they reproduce. We have in Surah Safat, verse 150, Allah is saying, Am khalaq, am This was rebuking the pagan Arabs of, for claiming that the angels were feminine, were female. Now, with regards to the names of the angels, there are only eight names which have been authentically recorded in Islamic texts. There are many in folklore. There are only eight, Jibril, the angel of revelation, Mikael or Mikal, 
the angel responsible for rain, Israfil, the angel who will blow the horn, signaling the end of the world, Malik, the name of the guardian of the hell, Munkar and Nakir, two angels who will question people in the grave, and Harut and Marut, two angels who are sent to the people of Babylon to test their faith. These are the authentic names of angels. All of the other names that we hear of, Israel and etc., uh, these names are either based on uh, Israeli uh, traditions, you know, traditions taken out of the Bible, biblical sources, or they're based on weak narrations, or fabricated narrations, or they're simply common uh, folklore names which have been chosen. Now, with regards to the abilities of the angels, we have been informed that they are able to read human intent. They're able to understand what is going on in the human mind. Prophet Muhammad Sallam was quoted by Abu Huraira as saying, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, the angels say to Allah that man intends to do evil, although he is more vigilant than them. He replies, watch him. If he commits evil, record it in kind. But if he abandons it, record for him one good deed, for surely he gave it up for my sake. So they have the ability to read human mind. And virtually all of the movement and activities which take place in the world are under their command or under their control or under their influence. And this is deduced from the, ver from the verse uh, in which Allah said, فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ amra," and other verses where Allah's command throughout the creation, because everything is by His command, you know, is assigned to the angels. They are also assigned to every human being from the time that they are formed in the womb to the time of birth. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was quoted by Anas ibn Malik as saying, Allah the exalted and glorious has appointed an angel as the caretaker of the womb that says, My Lord, it is like an oily drop. My Lord, it is now like a leech. My Lord, it has become like a clump of chewed flesh. Then if Allah wishes to complete its creation, the angel will ask, My Lord, will it be male or female? Furthermore, we have another narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that when the, the uh, fetus reaches the beginning of the fifth month, the angel breathes the soul into him. At that same time, four things are recorded. His livelihood, his lifespan, his deeds, whether he'll be wretched or happy. Besides that, each person has, two, has an angel assigned to him, or who, who may vary, not necessarily the same angel all the time, but an angel is with him throughout his life, encouraging him to good and guarding him from evil. This is part of that consciousness that we spoke of earlier in terms of the human being having a consciousness of good and evil. And we'll look at the evil side when we come to the world of the jinn. Prophet Muhammad said, every one of you has been assigned a companion from the, among the jinn and one from the angels. So these, these angels who are with us encourage us to good, put good suggestions in our minds, you know, and counteract the evil suggestions which would come from the evil source of the jinn. There are also two angels who are assigned to recording deeds. These are the ones most people know about. We can find in Surah Al-Fitar, verses 10 and 11, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ That verily there is assigned to you uh, protectors, or guarders, guardians, who are noble and who record. 
your deeds. Outside of this, we have angels in, throughout our life span, what takes place in our life. These angels who are with us recording are constantly with us. The, the angels which are assigned as a support to us, which are giving us good thoughts, at some times this, this angel may leave us. And this is what is referred to when Prophet Muhammad said that angels do not enter a house in which there is a dog or pictures or statues of living beings. Because the angels that are recording angels will not leave you at any time. So we shouldn't think, as some people might ignorantly feel, that um, they can avoid their record being uh, taking place, you know, being things, deeds being recorded if they keep a dog with them all the time, you know. At any case, with regards to a person dying, an angel is also assigned to take the soul at the time of death. And when the person dies, that soul is passed over to angels in the next life. And the angels who received that soul take the soul on a particular journey, which we will look at when we come to the series of lecture, the, the lecture on the judgment day. But it's enough to, to know that the angel takes our soul in the next life, takes it through a journey, then two other angels will come back to it whilst it's in the grave, in that state of the grave, and question it concerning its Lord, the prophet who was sent to it, and its religion. And that basically summarizes the information, basic information that has been revealed to us concerning the angels. And the significance of knowledge of the world of the angels is basically for human beings to know that all of their deeds are being recorded. Their thoughts are being monitored. This would help them to reflect before acting because it is, it is through acting hastily that we fall into sin. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had said that تَعَنِّي مِنَ اللَّهِ وَلَا عَجَلَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ that deliberate, careful action is from Allah and haste is from Satan. So by reflecting on the relationship that the angels have with us, this would help us to be conscious of the fact that our deeds are constantly being recorded and as such we would think twice uh, or think more than twice before doing some actions that we may consider. Now, Regarding the other world, which is the world of the jinn, and this world we said that the jinn were created from fire, and as we said previously, though the jinn are created from fire, we should not think of the jinn as being little wisps of fire that are puffing around you know, the place. No, they were created from fire, and of course people because we know that among the jinn there are some that are good and some that are evil. You know, if there is the hellfire, then how are the jinn going to be uh, punished? How are they going to, if they're already fire? Uh, th this is why we have to realize that though they were created originally from fire, as we human beings were originally created from clay, and we said we do not think our, of ourselves as being clumps of clay walking around, we don't think of the jinn in terms of the origin from which they were created. Though they were originally created from fire, they're no longer fire. And as we can be harmed by the earth, by the earth from which we are created, you can take a piece of clay, you know, harden it, make a brick out of it, and kill somebody with it. You know, though people were made from clay. Similarly, the fire can still be a source of punishment and is a source of punishment for the jinn who are evil, uh, even though they were originally created from fire. Now, the jinn were created on the earth before human beings. Allah mentioned this, خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلْ مِنْ نَارِ السَّمُومِ And I created the jinn before that from a fiery wind, in reference to the creation of man and the jinn. And from the narrations from Prophet Muhammad we know that they had populated the earth, and corruption had begun amongst them. And this is why when Allah 
informed the angels that he would create man and put him on the earth, man who had a free will as the jinn had, the angels questioned, would you put someone on the earth who would spread corruption and murder, etc., etc.? This was based on what they had observed of the jinn, whereas Allah told them that he knew what they didn't know. The jinn are divided into three basic types with regards to their modes of existence. Prophet Muhammad had said there are three types of jinn. One type which flies around in the air all the time, which can move within, an, within our uh, world and outside of our world. Another type which exists as snakes and dogs. And an earthbound type which resides in one place or wanders about when it attaches itself to people or objects. With regards to faith, as we mentioned, the jinn come in two categories as human beings, either believers or disbelievers. The munafiqun, the hypocrites, are considered to be a class of disbelievers. So people are either believers or disbelievers. Believers may be disobedient, uh, committing acts which are displeasing to God, but the faith is still there, they're still in the class of believers. One who goes out of that faith, disbelieving in God, rejecting God's message, revelation, rejecting the prophets, uh, rejecting uh, other deeds which God has prescribed for his creatures, such are classified as disbelievers. And the punishment for them is hell, whether they are among the jinn or among mankind. With regards to control of the jinn, because this is an area which people tend to get off into with, with the mythology and, and a lot of uh, folklore, etc., uh, where people tell stories about having these jinns doing this and that for them, you know, and uh, it's quite common. Any, in any part of the world you go, you'll hear all these types of stories. The fact is that no human being can gain control over the jinn. This was something specially given to Prophet Sulaiman. He made a dua, which is mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Sa'd, verse 35, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّن بَعْدِي O my Lord, forgive me and bestow on me a kingdom not allowed to anyone after me. Control, dominion over the jinn, this was given as a miracle to Prophet Sulaiman and to none after him. So much so that Prophet Muhammad uh, informed his companions on one occasion, saying, Verily an Ifrit, it's the more powerful among the jinn, spat on me last night, trying to break my prayer. However, Allah let me overpower him, and I wanted to tie him to one of the columns in the masjid, so you all could see him in the morning. Then I remembered my brother Suleiman's prayer. O oh my Lord, forgive me and bestow on me a kingdom not allowed to anyone after me. So Prophet Muhammad was able to keep the jinn off him, to restrain it, but not to control it. So anyone who tells you that they have this jinni that is under their control, etc., uh, you know right away that this is not true. What can happen instead is that a contract can be made. The relationship with the evil world of the jinn is through contract. And there are no good jinns coming into our worlds and doing favors for us. See, because they are banned from our world as we are not uh, allowed to, to interfere in, in their world. They're not allowed to interfere in our world. So it is only the evil among them that cross the barrier and interfere in our world. So we don't have, even though somebody will tell you, yes, I have this good jinn, he prepares food for me every day and cleans my house. You know, uh, if that is the case, uh, the jinn, evil among them, may try to gain control over a human being by appearing to them to be in their favor and to be doing things for them initially until they get their guard down and then eventually they work them over into the area of shirk because the main goal and effort on the part of the jinn is to draw human beings into disobedience of Allah and ultimately into shirk. Now, the area in which the jinn play the biggest havoc in human life 
and hum in the human world is in the area of fortune telling. This is one of the biggest areas. Because human beings have a natural desire to want to know the future. Everybody wants to assure for himself or herself a good life. So knowing what is in the future would then give one an opportunity to ensure for oneself good. So there have been people from the most ancient of times till today who sell information about good. They're, they come under the general heading of fortune tellers. Now, some of them are just guesswork. In fact, probably most of them are just guesswork, games, tricks, etc. But there is a body among them that have given solid and reliable information, pieces of information, which have made people believe in them as having these powers. And those among them that have this type of information, we can understand how they can get this type of information by understanding the world of the jinn and its relationship to us. We have a verse in the Quran, in which, or a number of verses, in which Allah speaks about the fact that the jinn, the class of them who are in the atmosphere and who move, can move uh, in our world, outside of our world, who go up to the lowest heavens and there they steal a listening. They listen in on what is discussed amongst the angels. When Allah commands angels, the inf commands go down through the heavens to the lowest heaven. And as they discuss it amongst themselves, some among the jinn manage to reach up to the level of the lower heavens, not entering it, but up to that level, and hear some of that information. However, they are driven away from that by meteors, comets, etc. And this is recorded in the Quran, in Surah Al-Jinn, this is described. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had mentioned that the jinn pass the information back down until it reaches the lips of the magician or fortune teller. Sometimes a meteor may overtake them before they could pass it on. But if they pass it on before being struck, they add to it 100 lies. So the, the reality is that the information that these people convey will be a mixture of lies and a few truths. What happens with people in general is that when they hear the predictions of a fortune teller, all of the information goes into their subconscious. And the false information, which is not confirmed by having taken place, is forgotten. Whereas the one thing which they tell them which is true, which takes place, the person remembers that. This is reinforced by the information which was initially given. And then the person will swear by that person. This is a fortune teller of the first class. This is a true fortune teller. So you have somebody like uh, Gene Dixon, died just at the end of last year, who was you know, a favorite fortune teller amongst the presidents of the United States and, and others. Every year, she would give her predictions for the year. It would be in the national newspapers, etc. And uh, people depended on her, her books. You know, They would study them, etc. But the fact, as I said, for her, as well as for people like Nostradamus and others, you'll find that when you look at the totality of what they say, the vast majority of what they mention is false, and there are only a few pieces of information which is actually true. But human beings with that tendency to want to latch on to anything which would indicate knowledge of the future, grab on to that small piece of information, and they end up depending on these people and in doing so, they end up falling into an area of partial disbelief or complete disbelief. The jinn can also help fortune tellers with immediate information, like somebody is coming to them, and they may get information about that person before the person reaches there. So you may go to see a fortune teller and he will tell you, or she will tell you, you know, what your name is, what the name of your parents are, how old you are, country you came from, etc., etc. That type of information is quite easy and quite accurate for them to get. Also, they can uh, give information about things which are uh, over distances, because we know the jinn are able to travel over the earth over huge distances, 
in short spaces of time. We know in, in the Quran in Surah Naml, with regards to the Queen of Sheba, when she was coming, uh, Prophet Suleiman asked one of the jinn to go and get her throne. And he said that he would get it for him before he even got up from his, the place where he was sitting. Because of the sacrilege and the heresy that is involved in dealing with the jinn, those involved in fortune telling, etc. Islam has taken a very strong stance against it. Prophet Muhammad was reported by his wife Hafsa to have said, the salah of whoever approaches a fortune teller and asks him anything will not be accepted for 40 days and nights. This is a question out of curiosity. It's not necessarily believing in what they're saying. The salah will not be accepted for 40 days and nights. This includes all of the different forms of fortune telling that are available in our society today. One of the major ways is through the astrological science. In almost every newspaper in the world today, you'll find a page which gives the zodiacal signs, the zodiac. Signs of the zodiac, your astrological predictions for the day. If you're a Cancer or Taurus or whatever, you know, this is a good day to do this or a bad day, you shouldn't do this, delay it until tomorrow or whatever. All of that, if one turns to that page, I mean, if you're opening the newspaper and you just happen to see it and you keep reading, no problem. You, you don't read the page, you just pass over it, no problem. But now if you're flipping open that newspaper looking for it, and you're saying, people say, don't read this. You said, I don't believe it. You know, it's just for fun. No. This is no for fun here. This is something very serious. As long as you're opening it and looking to see what your, you know, what your sign is, and you're looking to see what it has to say, then you fall under this statement of the Prophet wasallam. Your salah is not accepted for 40 days and nights. Now, this doesn't mean you've got a vacation for 40 days and nights from prayer. See, some people say, okay, you know, okay, no point if it's not accepted by Allah for 40 days and nights, no point to be praying. No, because when a person prays, two things take place. One, they remove from themselves the obligation of prayer. And two, depending on the level of concentration in their prayer, they earn a reward. Right? As Prophet Muhammad said, some people pray and only a tenth of the prayer is rewarded. Others only a fifth, etc., etc. So, though this is the case, if you've read your, your page, your astrological page today, you still have to continue to pray for the next 40 days, but the value, the reward for the prayer has been lost. Now, whoever goes looking for that page, believing in what it says, or goes to a fortune teller, palm reader, or whatever, getting their tea leaves read, believing in what the person is saying, Prophet Muhammad said, as reported by Abu Huraira and Al-Hasan, his grandson, whoever approaches a fortune teller and believes what he says has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is an act of disbelief. This is how serious Islam regards it. Now, there is another aspect of the world of the jinn which has significance to us. Beyond the world of magic, because this has also become a popular area in Western society today, people like uh, Daniels and David Copperfield and others who are dazzling people with feats of magic. And we know this is also a forbidden area those that are seriously involved in it are involved in using the jinn. The jinn help them. And uh, Islam is strictly against them. In fact, the uh, instruction that the companions followed when they went into the lands as Islam spread out of Arabia was to execute magicians. And the use of magicians is something forbidden even in the Old Testament. You can find still in what may be what they call the Torah, uh, in um, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 to 12, we find uh, what is attributed to God as 
saying, When you come into a land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among any among you those who burns his son or daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, that is fortune telling, a soothsayer is another term for a fortune teller, an augur, another term for a fortune teller, a sorcerer or charmer, these are magicians, or a medium, one who acts as a, a, a tool for the, the jinn to communicate with this world, or a wizard, that's a form of ma magician, or necromancer, other forms of magicians. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. So it is something forbidden in the religion revealed to the prophets and revealed to mankind. Though it has become very popular today. <clears throat> but the area which is probably the most uh, critical to, to note, besides this area of fortune telling, is that of demonic possession. Wherein, the jinns, because some among them are able to take different forms, are able to appear as apparitions and visions to people. Every year, people will see the uh, visions of, of Mary or the Christ child or whatever, you know, in different parts of the world, and this place becomes an area of pilgrimage. Or the statue, like in Ireland some years back, you know, statue of Mary started to rock back and forth. You know, and they thought maybe there was some seismic activity there. They brought geologists to check it out. No seismic activity, but the, the statue is rocking. And they couldn't find any explanation, but it, to analyze it as being a miracle, you know, these people are worshiping Mary anyway as the mother of God. And this became a place of pilgrimage, a small little village in Ireland. They made a big, uh, you know, international airport there for 747s to come in. You know, it's good business. <clears throat> At any rate, it became an area of fitna or trial for the, those people. Because, of course, this confirms their belief in Mary being the mother of God. You also find, <clears throat> you know, other instances. I know in, in, in Israel, I think, uh, last year, you know, there was one uh, picture of Jesus where the eyes were supposed to have closed or tears came from the eyes. It's happening all around the world, you know, uh, where, which all of this tends to confirm in people's minds that Jesus was God, Mary was the mother of God. But we understand that the jinn are able to possess objects. They're able to enter into objects and to cause movement in them or to cause sound from them. This is already recorded in Surah Taha, for example, uh, and, <clears throat> and other chapters of the Quran. With regards to Musa, Prophet, Prophet Moses, when he left his people and went to receive the commandments from God, and in his absence, an individual amongst them who was referred to as a Samiri, he asked the people to gather their gold jewelry, and he took up some dust which he claimed to have been the dust uh, remaining from the footprint of an angel, sprinkled it along with it, you know, mixed it up, and from it he created the shape of a calf. And as Allah says in the Quran with regards to him, فَأَخْرَجَ لَهُمْ عِجْلًا جَسَدًا لَهُ خُوَارٍ He took out for them a calf in the bodily form, which mood. Because the people were not going to take this as a god if it was just a statue. So what happened is that after creating the statue, the statue said, moo, as cows do. And of course, this is what, this is what shocked them and made them accept that this was in fact God. So they bowed down, they took it as a god besides Allah. Now, we know it wasn't the statue which was mooing, it was the jinn that had entered the statue and gave that sound. Similarly, <clears throat> we have events like that of Halaj's head, you know, according to the legends, the Sufi legends, that when Halaj, this was the individual who claimed that 
he was Allah. I spoke about him earlier. And when he was asked to recant, to give up this statement, he insisted standing up and ho opening his garment saying, there's nothing inside of this garment except Allah. So the Muslim judges had nothing else to do but to order his execution. So they took him and they cut off his head. And according to Sufi legends, if it's true, when they cut off his head, as his head hit the ground and rolled, it continued to say, An al haq, an al haq, an al haq. Right? According to their legends, right? It may be true, Allah knows. The point is that for them, this is confirmation that whatever he said, when he claimed that he was al haq, he was Allah, this was true. But the fact of the matter is that it could very well have been the jinn saying this out of his mouth and convincing the ignorant among them that <clears throat> in fact this man was speaking the truth. By understanding that the jinn can possess objects and even uh, human beings, we can understand also many of the things which are taking place in the world today. We spoke about flying saucers before that this, what is true amongst it, may be uh, from the world of the jinn, the jinn taking different forms, little green men or whatever, you know, or things which appear to fly at amazing speeds, whatever. <clears throat> as well as the things of what they call haunted houses, ghosts, etc., all of these experiences that uh, uh, people experience around the world, which they have no explanation for, that easily we can understand the role of the jinn in this matter. Even in the cases of apparent reincarnation, like they have a case which you know, took place, uh, and they have them, every so often you find cases similar to this. There was a girl in India back in the 70s, her name was Shanti Devi. And she was seven years old and she described a place where she had lived previously, in a previous life, in a town called Mutra, in a province far away from where she lived, and the people, the house, etc. When people went there, they found, in fact, there was somebody who lived there, and the house did look like that, and all this type of information. Now, for these people, this became a confirmation for them of reincarnation being a fact. The same thing happens amongst the Druze in Lebanon. From time to time, you'll find some young Druze kid who claims to, to describe a previous life. And the details may be very accurate when you go back and check the places where they're, what he describes or whatever, or she describes, will be very true. And for them, it confirms for them reincarnation. Because the belief in reincarnation, of course, is false belief. It's a false belief. It's based on the concept that the human soul is divine. That the human soul is a part of God which has come into this world, which continues to go through different cycles until eventually it rejoins with God. This is false. Human beings are not God in any way, shape, or form. What happens, how this takes place, is that, as Prophet Muhammad explained, the jinn, as we talked about dreams before, the jinn are able to come into our dreams. They're able to give us bad dreams, etc., and to implant ideas and thoughts which we might think are our own. So they may put this information about this previous child or person in that mind of the child, and the child thinks it's relating what is from its mind, you know, as its own, and people assume that it is its own memories, but in fact it is not. Similarly, when people do this re regression th therapy, where people go into a, a hypnotic state and they go back to previous lives, you know, they used to be in the Roman Empire, they were a centurion or whatever, you know, back to the cave days, they were on the Neanderthal, and you know, people describe all these previous lives, right? And, you know, it's a big, big fad in America today and in the West in general. Uh, very easily, these, are, these could easily be thoughts which are being fed by the jinn. Where we have to assume that all of these people who are doing it are not uh, faking, because of course, there are some people who no doubt are involved in quackery and just tricks and people, but so many people have been put through these uh, hypnotic states and have recounted these, type, these types of information, information about things that they didn't know. You know, they didn't study, they didn't have that kind of background. So the only way to really understand it is to understand it through the agency of the jinn. And what is related to this, of course, is the actual possession of human beings. You know, this is something which is well known in the Christian tradition. People have been exercised over the times from the time of Prophet Jesus till now. Exorcisms have taken place. And in other religious systems, exorcism also takes place. And from an Islamic perspective, 
it is recognized as being valid that people may be possessed. In fact, in the Prophet ﷺ's time, uh, a child was given to him who was uh, possessed and he blew in the child's mouth and told the, the, the being that was in the child to get out, get out enemy of Allah, you know, and uh, later the child was cured. And, and this is a clear evidence of, of um, <clears throat> exorcism. It exists also in the time of Prophet Jesus. There are records remaining in the Gospels of Jesus exorcising people who are possessed. And uh, when we look at the process of exorcism, the exorcism may take place basically in three ways. One, those who are involved in this calling on the jinn, etc., they may call on another jinn to drive out that jinn. And of course, this is forbidden because it involves also sacrilege. Or the jinn may leave by choice when idolatry is confirmed in its presence. That is, the priest waves the cross, you know, or the Buddhist priest recites their scriptures and the jinn leaves, confirming in the mind of that priest or the people around that their scriptures or their practices are true. The third and only acceptable way, of course, and this includes, that way includes people who may call on the jinn to leave in the name of Muhammad وسلم, or the name of saints and people are cured. This is because shirk has taken place in their presence. But the only acceptable way is according to the Islamic way, which is the recitation of the Qur'an or different prayers seeking refuge in Allah, which have been taught to us by Prophet Muhammad Now, <clears throat> if we look at knowledge about the world of the jinn, Prophet Muhammad explained to us so much information. Allah has revealed so much in the Qur'an about it. Even a chapter of the Qur'an is referred to as the chapter of the jinn. If it wasn't important, all of this effort would not have been made. It is important for us to understand that world because of its influence over our world. The evil from that world comes into our world and draws people into disbelief, into shirk, into idolatry. And we are informed about that world to be prepared, to be aware. When we hear you know, information, when we have personal experiences, etc., that these experiences or the information will not drive us into seeking illegitimate means of protecting ourselves. The illegit illegitimate means is through using fortune tellers or uh, magicians or those involved in other forms of, uh, of exorcism which are pagan in origin. You find Muslims, I've heard of Muslims in the Philippines going to Catholic priests to be exorcised and in other parts going to Buddhists, etc. for exorcisms. And, you know, this is a form of, of shirk, and it destroys the human belief. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us about the world of the angels and the world of the jinn in order for us to be conscious of that world and its relationship to us, in order for us to improve the quality of our deeds, realize the source of good that is around us, Realize that our deeds are being recorded and be more deliberate in our actions. Know about the evil from that spiritual world, the world of the jinn that can affect our lives and can delude us through apparitions, through visions, etc., etc., and draw us into these different forms of shirk. That is basically what I would like to share with you this evening with regards to the world of the angels and the jinn. Hopefully if there are any other areas that, with regards to it that you'd like to get clarification, you can present it in the form of questions and we'll include those along with the questions from yesterday's session.